dollars before or after the reading, and uh, Diane was good enough to bring uh, some broadsides that are free available. Paul has them over there by the door. You can pick one up on your way out today if you'd like. So uh, just a reminder. Also, uh, we would appreciate it if you would not smoke until the end of the uh, reading uh, uh, because a couple of people who very much want to be here are especially sensitive. And uh, so, so please be thoughtful enough to not smoke for the next while. And uh, we'll get started before long. The teams are available, and I uh, wonder where the best supplies to have. I don't know. I'll, I'll even here. I need a cigarette tray. So I can... <laughs> Welcome. Um, this reading with Diane Glancy, a, a Cherokee from Oklahoma, begins Native American Week. And I'd like to th thank the uh, Pearl Hope Fund and the Committee on Lectures for making this possible. Um, I first met Diane Glancy in uh, December of 1986 uh, in Tucson, Arizona, in the back of a van when we were driving from the airport to the hotel. We were both going to the same um, writer's convention. Um, and that began a, a friendship that's been going on for some time now. Diane has, um, she has three books out, One Age in a Dream, Brown Wolf Leaves the Res, and Offering. Um, her books will be um, on sale, you can buy them after the uh, reading. Also there will be some broadsides um, over by the door. Um, Diane Glancy is a, is a much uh, awarded poet. Um, recently won the Iowa uh, Woman's Award from the University of Iowa. She has her MFA um, from the University of Iowa. Um, she um, also is currently teaching at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. So without further much ado, I'd like to introduce Diane Glancy. It's very nice to be here. I hope you all can hear me back there. If you can't, let me know. I think the first thing to say about the Native Americans is how different uh, we are. Just like the tribes of Europe, the French and the Germans, the Woodland and the Plains Indians are very different. I'm from a Woodland tribe, uh, corn farmers, sedentary, uh, were evangelized very easily, had a syllabary in 1821 never saw a buffalo nor a teepee nor the other things that many Indians did. Originally, the Native Americans are from the Orient, coming across the Bering Strait about 1,500 years ago. And in this first poem, two men, sleeping face and old bull thigh, are sitting on their front porch talking about how things got as they are. How sleeping face and old bull thigh a row of beaver bones for a rib vest, a canoe-shaped smile. Sit in the shade and say the ancestors came to the new world on the land bridge of the Bering Strait. They hunted mammoths, planted maize and beans and squash, and the sky seemed clear was soon crammed with clouds, every corner of it, like settlers' wagons and then farmer sheds built with scraps and stuffed with cultivators and hay, and the dust storms with lightning sparklers rolled up the prairie and how swatting flies, the ancestors must have wondered what land bridge the white man crossed, what mammoth he followed from the other way. I think one of the first jobs of any culture is to make stories to tame the world so that these foreign elements are very familiar. The Native American for a long time did not have a horse or a gun. And the first time he saw the horse, he called it a sacred dog, trying to make it familiar. And so, of course, when the airplane came along, it was the sacred horse. 
This poem is called Evolution of the Sacred Dog. Our fathers called the horse Sacred Dog, tied crow feathers to his mane. Four trunks of legs our fathers rode. Now afraid to fly in grandfather clouds, our eyes shrivel to walnuts. We tie crow feathers to our seat, tell ourselves the plane is sacred horse. A result of acculturation is bringing these foreign objects also into something, into one's own sphere, into the familiar. This poem is called Clothes Horse. Heifer brown in her buckskin dress, horse in corral with sun across its mane brown, falling leaf brown when she walks, closest bush to the road brown, fry bread smell in the grease brown. Horses graze as needles stitching the grass. She covers herself with porcupine quills, raccoon stripes, feathers of the mottled hens, and skunk grass. Not awake yet, brown in the head of her buckskin dress, lonesome red of the plucked rooster comb. The metallic strip of silo reminds her of a beading needle. Not muzzled with buttons, her bosom waddles under the dust storm of her buckskin dress, somewhere the prickly pear of her nipple flesh. She is the only squaw with a closet in her teepee. The first morning light through the flat trees brown. She cuts through fields and hunting grounds, her brown buckskin dress fringed with elk teeth. She is on her way to the yard goods store, mouth stained red as winter berry. Gourd rattle brown, buck brush brown, wild turkey brown, wood duck brown, running dog into the hills brown. Her brave hunts all season for pelts and hides while she sits warm as campfire. Leggings, sashes, belts, turtle shells, blankets, shawls, combs, bags, hornet nest hats. It takes a two-horse travois to get her to winter camp. I am always torn between myth-making and tearing myths apart. There were many myths that I grew up with that always frightened me as a child. The little people's tales. They were out in the woods and would get you if you weren't careful. And animal transformations which always bothered me, and then if you see an owl, it's an evil omen. And it, and it was the superstitions that, at well, the end of this poem says they're all under the headband, which in a way they're not either. This poem is called Write Justly. When he moved into the house, he wanted us to stomp and pray out the evil spirits just in case they'd be there. How could they, when a medicine woman lived on the place and left it to the church when she went to happier grounds? But a truck hauling brush turned on the road, and he jumped up screaming, Deer Prowler, at the antlered beast. We danced out the spirits he carried on the place. How now, powwow, he jumps in the sow yard with a bow-wow cow. We passed the spirits to chickens to peck their legs, evil spirits pockmarked as the dartboard. With marble shooting rabbit eyes, we stomped wildfire fires he once built in his head, still haunted him, as though evil spirits could open a medicine woman's door, climb into her unpainted windows, crawl through yellow wallpaper, armored with prayer chants. We whooped and hawed until he said enough, the house barricaded from deer prowlers from under his headband. These poems that I read were from one age in a dream. It's kind of an end time, a millennial time, when all ages come together. I'm going to read now a few poems from Offering, or Al Skodal Dodi, which is a Cherokee. The beginning poem in this manuscript contains my genesis. I wrote for a long time and would never read anything that I wrote. I always thought it was wrong. There, there's a sense of, of privacy. You don't share the inner life. I remember growing up being told to be quiet over certain things. and. So for years I wrote and never read, and finally I had this wonderful dream. Great, great grandmother came into the room and she said to me, speak. I think all Native Americans have at least several grandmother poems. That's kind of a trademark. Another theme often is the closeness of nature, the closeness of the great spirit. There's no distance at all. A sense of loss is another thing. Great, great grandmother steps into the room. Her head small as a pecan, her body large as husks from corn. Haye, heyo, she speaks in dreams. Through narrow channels of the prairie, a stream of sheep pass into her head. She tends them on the hill, where small rocks cluster like a flock. Moccasins tied to thick feet, her leggings dangle with puffin beaks. She is from the north now, her dress fish skin, wooden snow goggles with slits for eyes. 
Her mouth shriveled to a cedar berry. She speaks through the blue opening in her head. Her brittle dress crackles and her voice, tee he she laughs with narrow vision, and her small words say to me, speak. And I always say that to my writing classes, now it's your turn, you speak. I can still see her hand going like that. I don't really know if it was really her or just my inner self telling me that it was now time to share. I also have a poem about great-grandmother who is the daughter of great-great-grandmother. I had um, been watching educational television one night and Carl Sagan said that the universe was round and I love that thought because the great spirit loves to work in circles. The earth is round, the orbit is round, our life cycle is round, birds nest are round. So I was having lunch one day in my farmhouse in Iowa City and here comes great grandmother. Not really there of course, but this was through imagination. And she had just come back from traveling the universe and I asked her what it was like out there and indeed it is round. The poem is called Meatloaf. Now great grandmother comes through the back door, her ears latticed like corn cribs, her legs tied with chicken wire. Her limbs had been taken quickly apart, bones dismantled, spirit folded up. She moves around the room. Come, I put my hand on the table. She sits in a chair. Her eyes are blown out by solar wind. I have heard the breath in her throat when I scrape the rake across the bare yard. Two fingers on her hands rattle like winter leaves on the tree. Words hiss through her head. How can I understand? Dugaski ve hasanak. I shrug in frustration. How do I tell her that even the words of her Cherokee language do not survive? I put her hand to my head, but she takes it away. She is not deaf or blind. I see her buckskin tattered by the teeth of wolves. Her feet trail bits of a comet. I put the drip pan under her. Something like grease spots the floor. Her heart simmers from the long trip. I hear it sputter as she cools. For a moment, she seems to forget where she is, and I hold a piece of grass to her nose, crumble a leaf in her fingers. I pass her my plate of meatloaf. She smiles, and I see her teeth collapse like old stars. She puts the napkin on her lap and prays, one Ogalit said. She lifts the teacup with her two fingers. I watch her eat. Later, we could peel apples or weed broom corn. She could do anything. I point to the vast plains of space at the end of my porch. She makes a circle with her thumb and finger. Even the universe is round, and I nod that I've heard it so. I wonder what turn she missed to get here. I see my thought reaches her. She only stops for a visit, grabbing what she could to wear. Otherwise, she'd be invisible to the eyes I have in my head, the little bowls of lard, chana, she spits, then sweeps crumbs from the table. I watch the buffalo cross her cheek. Under the dress, there are grapevines for a ribcage. In her pocket, a map of pit stops on the large arc of her restless migration. She was the same grumpy little woman as she'd always been, and here she'd been out traveling the universe. I expected more. This poem is called War Dance at the Waldorf. The feet of spotted horse gallop over loose streets. His hua hails a cab. The driver sees us stumble into the half night of the city and does not stop. War paint on buildings, cars with broken glass and dented fenders, traffic turns like the reservation windmill. We take the subway uptown where voices sound buffalo and prairie wind. Spotted horse goes into the Waldorf. We cannot hold him back. Red flowers bloom in the lobby above plush rugs, black as burn fields. Peacock feathers watch us pass thick as brush along the country road. Upstairs we knock on doors. Rooms are like the reservation, a compartment for each one of us. Spotted horse stomps his feet, scares the buffalo in his head. hoo Men come to quiet Spotted Horse. He thinks they are soldiers and war dances at the Waldorf until red streets press between black streets. It takes a regiment to hold Spotted Horse. We leave in a police wagon. Spotted Horse still spouts his oracle, hoo Dust of the stampede comes from his head. He is back on the reservation, the one time the creek rose and the cemetery fence caught brush and twisted limbs. Spotted horse paddles all night in his sleep. By morning, we wait at the bus station in New York. Tail of the windmill blows, a crow feather. Blades turn like Venetian blinds at the Waldorf. I wish I could say hua like it really needs to be said, but you just have to imagine it. 
I lived in Oklahoma for many years, and as I traveled around, I would just make notes. This is in the Texas Panhandle, and it's called Red Steam. It's when that red soil lifts up off the ground in the wind. On the high plains, a few trees lean to the north, a ragged band of Indians. We pick up bones from ex extinct animals and old glaciers. The sun holds a hand over our sight. The river is empty when we pass. The water on a war party will be back after rain. The riverbed bridge ready for its return. Fierce winds lift the flat sheet of fields and the dust is red steam. The great spirit moves across the harsh land, fence posts shimmy. A bird calling from the field just as we pass trills in our narrow head. We know, as we have always known, we are not at home here. One of my favorite pastimes in Oklahoma was sitting in the back window about this time of year watching the tornado clouds go by. I've really seen very few tornadoes when the tail actually comes down, but um, the wonderful clouds are there, greenish and pink, in many wonderful forms. And privets, by the way, are little um, shrubs. They're related to the olive, little shrubs with white blossoms on it. And this poem is called Tornado, and the first four words, T-O-R-N, are caps. Privets rustle under storm winds, their white skirts tremble, a warlord on the prairie somewhere, a groom, a hun in black. They will lose their blossoms and bear round fruit, hail gallops, whooping rain, then silence. Their own petals strewn before them, the privets wait for the choice of the warlord, hail balls on the ground like rice after the abrupt nuptials. There always was a wonderful union between the sky and the earth during a tornado. Something holy about it and its terror. This poem is called Flood because the sandy soil does not let that rain into it. And we do have floods very often. And this flood has seven O's in it, so I guess it would be pronounced flood. Buffalo stampede, angry the fire sticks kill them. They climb down from the death rack, return from the spirit world with war poles. Their fur swirls in debris, their anger, the mud left after water recedes. This was written out in New Mexico, start of a long trip. It's a very short poem, too. The sun comes up like a ceiling light in my eyes. It was dark when we drove toward the mountains and through them. Now in the east, the sun is vivid as nightmares. Long shadows, black as light cords, plug into bushes. Pinions glimmer with dew, and we praise the dawn when all thin things seem connected. I think that's one thing I appreciate about my Native American heritage. Though being fragmented, so broken, yet there is a sense of connectedness, a sense of unity between the whole universe. I think if I had to write one poem, about what it's like to be a Native American, it is this one. It's called Solar Eclipse, which happened in Oklahoma May 30th, 1984, and I'm sure it did up here. It really wasn't a whole eclipse, but it was kind of yellowish for a while, the light was. Each morning, I wake invisible. I make a needle from a porcupine quill, sew feet to legs, lift spine onto my thighs. I put on my rib and collarbone. I pin an ear to my head, hear the wax wings yellow cry. I open my mouth for berries, stick on eyes. I almost know what it is to be seen. My throat enlarges from anger. I make a hand to hold my pain. My heart a hole the size of the sun's eclipse. I push through the dark circle's tattered edge of light. All day I struggle with one hair after another until the moon moves from the face of the sun and there is a strange light as though from a kerosene lamp in a cabin. I put on a dress, a shawl over my shoulders. My threads are knotted and my scissors gleaming. Now I know I am seen. I have a shadow. I extend my arms, dance and chant in the sun's new light. I put a hat and coat on my shadow, another larger dress. I put on more shawls and blouses and underskirts until even the shadow has substance. I don't know, Steve, how long you wanted me to read. I could quit here. There could be questions. I could read another poem. It's up to you. Okay. 
I lo- I listen to Michael Stan here for quite a while. Um, I have a lot to read. Let's see, maybe the people back I think as a writer, one of the most important things you have to do is read. You have to know what other people are writing. You just can't read in a vacuum. And then the second most important thing I do is take notes. Anything that passes, I'm always noting down. For instance, this poem that I'm going to read, Pasture for Rent. I was on my way to one of the schools in Oklahoma, and I passed this sign, Pasture for Rent, and I love that sign. What would I do with a whole pasture? I have no animal bigger than a cat. I wrote that down. I had got to the school. I was artist in residence many years in Oklahoma. And this teacher had been to a wedding, and the bride had cried through the ceremony, through the reception, the whole thing, and she didn't know why, so I wrote that down. She also said that her feet had hurt, and she'd taken off her shoes to dance. On the way home, a red squirrel started across the road, then halfway changed his mind and turned back, and I wrote that down. And after that, I had gone to Kansas City to see my mother, who, to get the zipper up the back of her dress because she was old and arthritic, had a a string safety pin to it. So one morning I get up and I have all these fragments and I started this poem. And I think writing is very similar to living. We just have to make sense out of all the broken fragments. Pasture for rent. I would rent the pasture if I had horses. Their hooves like wind through new grass. Barefoot as guests at a wedding after dancing all night. But dawn washes in with sobering light. And I remember how the husband lifted his bride's veil to wipe her eyes. What did she cry about as she danced with her new husband, her father and brothers, heart thundering like horses in her chest? Is she like that squirrel who starts across the road, then suddenly halfway turns back? Just wait until she is an old woman with a string pinned to her zipper to pull it up the back of her dress. Then she will have reason to cry into the emptiness of the pasture for rent. I have another poem that is pieced together. This is called Navajo, and I will explain. Also, I have this this friend. He's a full-blooded Navajo from uh, Arizona. His family was a sheep herder. And I was looking for some Indian names because I was starting into a play. So we went up to Pahuska Cemetery, which is about 30 miles north of Tulsa. And I wrote down these names. And I was also writing down everything else. There was a, a diesel tractor over on a hill, and it reminded me of the little pet pet. It reminded me of the cat when I sit on, when she sits on my lap and I pet her. So I was writing that down. I was thinking about the horizontal traffic because I could hear the highway, the distant highway. And then I was thinking about the vertical. I mean, the ho- at first I was thinking about the vertical traffic and then the horizontal. Because uh, I was thinking our spirit's going up to heaven as we're standing here talking. Is the great spirit coming down to help us when we need help? Uh, also, we were in the 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 part of the cemetery, first of all, where the children were buried, and there were these little stone lambs all over the ground, and of course he, being a sheep herder, was getting homesick for his sheep, I suppose. So I started into the poem, The Bleeding Hill Fits Your Sheep, and that did not really make sense, but I just kept pushing and going with my thought, your headband half tied to the other. He was half in Oklahoma and half in Arizona. So I won't explain any more, Navajo. The bleeding hill fits your sheep, your headband half tied to the other, a rest you can't tend. This this land in the shadowed hole of your eye, let the Father know if you ever want. These graves before us, Osakipa, Nishei, Emma Strike Axe, No Ear, Hampadika, Marbles in the Cement Cross. The medicine woman says your ear stops up because you were near the dead, but Shano, at Osage Cemetery, Bahuska, these dead are gifts for their having lived in the glades of our mind. Our breast tender for grazing them, little bear, big horse who went to war. A child's toy whistle I hear, the cat with the sound of a diesel tractor on a hill, artillery fire from big horse in war. I feel them moving like distant traffic on the highway, descending, climbing. In the glare of this last summer heat, we are in the midst of a freeway, bugs and birds and spirits with bundles and lambs on their back, bleeding, letting the Father know when they need a hand. This poem is called Second Hand. You tell me the lame elk paws the snow outside your cabin again this winter. The others wait while he nuzzles the smothered grasses. 
He defends his plot of ground when they come near, snorting, butting with his head. He eats close to the window while you watch, maybe so you will see his struggle, his bravery and valiance. Maybe this is the lesson he holds out to you, as though you were tame enough to eat from his hand. I have a piece that I'd like to read, but it's kind of long. I guess I will go ahead. It's the last portion of uh, offering, and it's called Photo Frames 1 through 11, Kansas City Stockyards. And in parentheses it says, or how to be Indian. In a way, this might be more fiction. It's kind of a hybrid. It's both fiction and poetry. Father, you are the absolute I struggle toward all my life, the absolute I struggle away from. At 60 miles an hour after your funeral, it seems I hardly move. A few angus blow past like cardboard boxes in the wind. An old house leans into the prairie, like your head against the back of the chair, all those afternoons you dozed. A feeling knocks about in the head, like wrapping papers in the garage, when you forgot to put down the door, and the wind, or a neighbor's dog, sniffs them out. We move more times than I can remember, always on the road. You knew the names of ducks and clouds. You knew the name of evening. I only saw the highway into the narrow universe and knew when your heart began to slow, like the large clock in the old farmhouse. It seems we always moved and didn't get anywhere. Aye, Indian chants oozed from your heritage in those dreams everyone has. We run in place as though treading air and never escape. Frame number one. Father, you were leader of the animals in the stockyard, finely plant superintendent. I loved you, hated you, Father. I carry your anger like a cattle prod. What is it we could never settle? A pinhole camera I look into and find only parts of what must be whole. You came to the stockyards in Kansas City before I was born, lived there until I was 11. You were transferred again and again. When we were still in Kansas City, I went to work with you on Saturdays. We turned left into the 12th Street Viaduct and drove down the upper level, making the journey from Kansas City, Missouri on the bluffs to Kansas City, Kansas in the river bottoms. Our blue 39 Dodge seemed a spirit vision. I stood close to you when I was small. Later, I sat on my side of the car with an arm resting on the window. From the stockyards, we returned on the lower level of the viaduct because I asked you to. In the summer of 1951, the Kaw River flooded passing over the stockyards and nearly climbing the 12th Street Viaduct with its cargo of dead pigs. Frame number two. It was after the flood you were transferred to packing houses in several Midwestern towns. Later, the old stockyards were raised. Hogs and cattle would be killed in process in the same place they were born, eliminating their long and expensive transport by truck or rail. Father, you are dead now also, and the stockyards with you, and yet you are alive. I am still the quantum of the small papoose who would hunt your world. Frame number three. In the old days, there were 4,200 cattle pens, 700 hog pens, 400 sheep pens, and 15 brick mule and horse barns. I have a yellow news clipping. The record was set October 19, 1943, when 64,015 cattle were yarded. You were there that day, Father. And all those days, the stockyards thrived in its glory. And when it dried up, you shriveled with it the final sleep toward which you always lean from your chair in the living room. Frame number four. After your funeral, there is still a cattle pen of language between us, the shoot directly to the kill, old lead bull. I follow you up the ramp and you step aside and lead me to face the sudden end before I was ready to leave you and be strung upside down, blood spilling to the slaughtering floor. I look at you with a pink eye that swept the cattle yards, the bags of bone fertilizer. Leaves should be white also, and we should be at peace. Clouds pass in the high sky like Indians on the ghost trail you now follow. This long journey is to be Indian, having no place to go, but going anyway. The moving grasses remind me of our trail. You, Father, brought me here to this chair where I sit after your funeral, Hibote. Waves of the sea slant away from Kansas City back into our ancient wandering before our way of life was pulled off us like skin from cows. The barren moon of the cattle yard, now you have the sleep you lost, moo. Frame number five. In the kitchen, a pomegranate and pepper have 
I rinse the lungs of the pepper in cold water. The flat seeds, like tiny white bats, clustered in their caves, cut across with a knife slit in the neck. The tiny seeds, like so many pots and pans hanging over us in the roof of our kitchen, the attic above which we move like the dream of cows after their death. In you, Father, some chambered part cut into my heart, dug out these small clustered moons, a tribe no longer on its land, even the coyotes laugh and anger oozes. When the wind is out of the west, the smell of the cattle yards climbs the bluff and raids Kansas City, the nice buildings behaving themselves and clustered like my heart. I take my peering knife, gut them myself, yes I would. To be Indian is to have the heart of revenge and to not know where to unload nor how is hidden the old way of life that howls in the night. The coyotes, they beat off holding pins of the cattle before they were loaded into railroad cars and shipped to Kansas City. Frame number six. In this picture, which comes from our images upside down in the camera, like cattle hanging in lockers, stripped of hooves, tails, head, after the kill, we are standing by one another, the fence in the background, a line cut into the horizon, or a line of thought from your head, which you never shared with me, and yet I knew everything. Maybe the anger stems from that and grows up like devil's claws that catches around the cattle's hooves. Oh, this is where I am much older. See, I am tall as you with my son when he was a baby, and I visited you and wanted to drive the car to Kansas City when you lived not 50 miles away and you wouldn't let me have your car. And I felt backed into a corner, helpless, because you had the car and the money and I had none and asked you for them, but you held power over me and I was mad yelled at you, screamed, I would do what I want, left the next day, and would not be your Indian, because how to be Indian is not to be. And I longed for my own existence, independent of you, who had my feet I needed for the bottom of my legs so I could walk. You made it hard for me, this noise between us, that is only moves, and how can I be free of you now that I am gone from you? You are the other side of the enclosure with all the names you knew, and we are not together. Why should I want to be? Frame number seven, engine arrows in breath, lessen us from strife. Frame number eight, now back down the road, we travel all the way to the old place where the dirt road, the drive ran into the yard, the porch, the large tree, Father, we are at home. All the moons we had clustered in this pepper, I cut into after your funeral. You were never clearer than on this day, under the air cold as a glass window, the shade of the winter tree, a net fallen over us, consumed like steaks and ribs you brought home from the stockyards. Frame number nine. I know the highway through this land, the spirit road. I know just where it passes. I feel the movement of traffic caught in their own pace, their own realm passing through one another simultaneously. The war you didn't want me to see when I travel with you all the time, this life of neglect and want, finally makes inroads and I feel what you feel, Father, small intervals of the album on my lap. I'm angry you never shared it with me. I'm angry over your anger that sometimes oozed out of you like a bull that tried to climb the fence the times you whipped me as though I were a scared cow that didn't know where the gate was to the loading car, which was and is and will be. Frame number 10. Father, you should have known I would return the small, dark child you loved. Frame number 11. And it's all right, because it will be, where there is a place where we are herded and our snot is wiped, our bruised and bruising, bruising heels, our hooves are healed, our diseases washed, and we are clean and whole. And it is the place we should dream of in our spirit dreams, the marks we should draw on our teepees and walls of our house, but try to be ready in it, while you are on a, in a body of four legs and a mouth that opens and moves with slobbers. We should forget our bad times, relish the good with delight, like pomegranates bursting from their seed, and have it here in our album, so it is a pinhole back into the life we had, and one interval will not have to jump another, the way a train track used to take cattle to the yards, and we would drive down the viaduct in Kansas City, where you will be again, Father, when I arrive, your face smiling, your arms open wide. Thank you. I think that's enough.